your Bibles open then to Revelation chapter number 12. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking about the devil this morning. And you know how it is when you, when you talk about Satan. He doesn't like it. <laughs> and uh, he's, boy, he's been kicking a fit with me, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, we're going, to take a, we're going to take a shot right at him this morning. Amen. And I think you're going to enjoy and appreciate and be helped by the lesson. So our main text is verse 9 of chapter 12, but we're going to read through verse 11. <clears throat> I'll read aloud. You follow along in your Bible. In the uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, <clears throat> a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. <clears throat> and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. <coughs> and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, <clears throat> and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Father, help me to teach this lesson, to make it clear and plain in the heart of each one that's here. And that can only happen if you, Lord, by your Spirit, inscribe upon these hearts the message from your heart to theirs. In Jesus' name, I'm asking you for that. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, it only happens if he speaks and we listen. We've got to hear the word of the Lord as it's spoken to us. Well, God gives Satan four epithets, four descriptive phrases or terms, four words or four expressions that are used to identify and describe our great enemy. And the first of these four is this. He's a great dragon. You could cross-reference that with Job 41, as we'll do in a moment, to gain some insight into the significance of that epithet. He is a great dragon. It speaks of his immense power. He is called that old serpent. That old serpent. Goes way back. Goes all the way back to the very beginning. All the way back to Genesis 3 in terms of human history. And he is the ancient enemy of man. He is called in this verse, verse 9, the devil. Jesus said that he would cast the prince of this world out. <clears throat> the devil is the prince of this world. The word indicates that he is a, a malignant adversary. A malignant adversary. And then he's called Satan. And that word tells us that he is the accuser. And he's particularly wicked in his accusation. He tempts us into sin. And then turns around and uses that to accuse us. So I want to talk about dealing with your adversary and my adversary. And the first four principles that help us in dealing with this, our greatest of all adversaries, are found in these four terms that are used to identify him. So let's look at each one. First, the dragon. In Job 41, he's referred to as Leviathan. Now some people think it, that's referring to a hippopotamus or... You know, a lot of weird things like that. I know we, we laugh because if you know that description, it's the only hippopotamus I know that smokes. <laughs> He's got fire coming out of him, you know, sparks coming out of his mouth and all kinds of weird stuff. 
And I've never seen a hippopotamus that had scales like a fish and so on. I mean, there are a lot of weird ideas out there. People struggling who read the scripture with blinders on. They can't see truth because they don't know truth. They just don't get it. But you take the whole testimony of scripture together and it's obvious when you come to that passage. In fact, it's interesting how many times I've kind of run this test in years bygone um, with believers who've been saved for a little while, read the Bible a little while, heard some preaching. I'll ask them, read Job 41, tell me who you think it is. And every single one of them say, that's the devil. Now, why can't a babe read that chapter and know they're talking about the devil there? And yet some sophisticated guy, supposedly sophisticated, if you know what the word sophisticated means, you would understand that I'm not being complimentary. <laughs> These people, their sophistry and their arrogance and so on, they, they, really, they just can't see what it's saying. It's obviously uh, a description of Satan himself, the power of the sea, and the sea being representative of all the peoples of the world that, that cover the planet. And uh, that that is also a symbol used in the Bible for peoples and nations and tongues and so on. And, and so Satan is the power of the people. It's interesting. He's the, he's the power. He's now the prince and the power of the air. And the Bible refers to him as a dragon. And in Genesis, uh, sorry, in Job 41, he's described as an immensely powerful creature. And the first principle then is this. You cannot defeat him. Now, that's curious since the whole premise of the message is on how to defeat him. <laughs> but I'm going to begin right there because this is the truth. You cannot defeat him. That is, in the flesh. In your own strength, you cannot defeat him. He is too strong for you. He is too smart for you, and he is too strong for you. You cannot outweigh him. All these movies talk about doing a deal with the devil and tricking the devil and all this kind of nonsense. It's, it is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. In fact, that is just kind of a double reverse trick of the devil to cause people to imagine that they can do dealings with him and come out on top. You cannot do a deal with the devil and come out on top. You never will. Satan is way, way too intelligent. He's way too smart. He's way too powerful. So the first principle is you need to understand right now, this is a formidable foe. This is a being, a creature, who has immense, I mean immense power. Now, he's not as powerful as God, but he's extraordinary in his power. He's not as smart as God, but he is extraordinary in his intelligence. He's not as wise as God, but he is extraordinary in his devilish kind of wisdom, in that earthly kind of wisdom. He's, he's a extraordinary. The chief characteristic, as is pointed out in Job 41 about Satan, is this. The dragon, I'm sorry, is this. Full of pride. Pride is the number one characteristic of our enemy. Probably at the root of, of his corruption is that statement in Ezekiel where it says that he, as it were, looked at himself and began to think of himself as beautiful, as be glorious and wonderful and wise and all that. He began looking at himself. No longer was he fixed on God above him and greater than him and more glorious than him and rejoicing in his glory he began to rejoice in his own glory. He began to rejoice in his own beauty. He began to rejoice in his own wisdom and his own intelligence. That's what's brought out in Ezekiel chapter 28. And in that prideful arrogance, he set his affections on things well below. He set his affections on things of the earth. He set his affections on things uh, that are material, the material universe, the material world. And so... That's where we get the expression, the love of money is the root of all evil. Because when Satan in his pride put his affection upon the things of this earth, he was corrupted and iniquity was found in him, the Bible says. And it literally birthed iniquity into being. You know, for God didn't create sin. He does create evil. He creates evil as the chastisement for sin. That's what evil is. And we talked about that a few lessons ago. The close relationship between sin and evil causes many of us to hear the word evil and think it's about sin. But actually, evil is the damage, the wreckage, the destruction that comes into our lives when we sin. And that was ordained by God and built into his creation. So the first principle, we look at these four names, if you will. We'll just say it that way. These four names for the devil, for Satan. One, the great dragon. He is great. 
and he is powerful. And he's real. And the Bible says he goeth about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's constantly on the prowl. He's always looking for an opportunity to make a meal out of your life. The Bible says we need to avoid the lust of the flesh. Why? Because those things war against our soul. More on that as we proceed. But get this now. First, you have the great dragon, and he is the sly deceiver. The sly deceiver. And he's full of pride. And then we have that old serpent. That old serpent. Genesis chapter 3 gives us all kinds of insight into how Satan is a subtle seducer. He's a sly deceiver. He's a subtle deceiver, a subtle seducer. The Bible talks about seducing spirits that teach doctrines of devils. And we tend to think, and I think with some merit, that he's talking about Jehovah's Witness, denial of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, denying that he is God manifest in the flesh, uh, denying the authority of the Word of God and creating a Bible of their own to support their false doctrines. We think about the Mormons and Joseph Smith with his peeping stones reading some kind of hieroglyphics or whatever that he supposedly dug out of Mount Palmyra and, and comes up with all these weird, odd doctrines uh, that descended down to Brigham Young saying that Adam is God and the only God we have to do. We think of these seducing spirits as being the originators of these serious major false doctrines. Let me tell you that these seducing spirits also whisper lies into your ears that trap you into certain sins. Let me give you some simple examples. He could put a lie or a suspicion in your mind or in your heart toward another brother or sister or toward a family member. He could put a suspicion in your mind. And that suspicion, he can use that suspicion say, to just work you and 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 cause division and problems and in your own life and in the lives of those around you. But it's a lie. It's a seducing spirit that teaches that doctrine that comes from a devil, that idea, that thought, that teaching that you take as true when it's not true. So be very careful about evil suspicions. And then you have other, uh, other areas, you know, Satan. Well, let me go back to that a little bit. Satan can come and whisper in the mind of some man some evil suspicions about his wife and cause him to become jealous of her and use that jealousy to ruin that marriage. Satan can come along and whisper some lie into the mind or heart of that wife about her husband and she'll believe that and act on that and begin behaving in a way based on those lies and destroy the marriage. I've seen that happen more than once. Um, we can go through a long list of things. You know, it can happen in the church. You know, somebody uh, takes a notion that comes from the devil about somebody else and uh, then starts repeating that to other people and starts making all kinds of problems. That's the devil's work. We need to, you know, the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices, but we need to sometimes stop and think, wait a minute, am I getting, am I becoming active, an active participant in some device of the devil to create division in my family, my church family, in the community, whatever. I mean, be careful about the devil. Amen? Watch out for him. He tries to plant these lies in your mind. And what I really want to get across right now is we don't these seducing spirits that these doctrines of devils don't categorize that as, well, that's not applicable to me because I believe what the Bible says. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> he might get to you in other ways. See, he might get to you in a lot of other ways. So be careful about that. He is more subtle, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, than any beast. And you might say, well, that leaves me out. He's not more subtle than me. But the Bible says that men become brutes. That means they become beast-like they become beast-like in their thinking. They become people who are controlled by their appetites. It's almost impossible to say enough about this, to get this across. You've got to control your appetites. And I mean all of them. Whether it's an appetite for food, whether it's an appetite for entertainment, whether it's an appetite for rest, whether it's an appetite for sex, whether it's an appetite for whatever, you name it. Whatever the appetite. And God designed us with these various appetites, you know. We do have these things as part of our design. But you have got to have them under control. If your appetites are controlling you, you are headed toward ruin. You must control your appetites. 
Amen. And you must satisfy those appetites according to the righteousness of God. Satan uses these appetites in your life to bring your soul into bondage. That's what he does. That's his game plan. So you need to watch out for that. And uh, this subtle deceiver knows that. He watches you're like a snake. That's why he's called the old serpent. And as he's depicted in the book of Genesis, uh, it's very complicated to go into that and look at it very carefully. We won't spend the time to do that right now. But you have this serpent in the garden that's more subtle than any other creature there. Uh, and all the indications are that it was able to speak because, well, it spoke. <laughs> and the indications are clear that it walked upright because its curse was to no longer walk upright but to crawl. So this being, this creature, was probably the nearest thing to man that was in the garden at that time. And Satan seized upon that creature and used it to get to Eve. And he seduced her. How? He watched her. He watched her. We don't know how long it took for her to finally make her way over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which her husband had told her that she shouldn't eat it and that she shouldn't even touch it. There's some insight there I'll throw out there very quickly as an aside, but you've got to be careful about adding to God's word. You know, God so told uh, Adam, don't eat it. He didn't say, don't touch it. Now, it's probably a good idea not to touch it. I imagine you'd have a hard time eating it if you didn't touch it. And that's exactly where some of these legalistic rules come from. They come from the idea, well, if I build all these man-made rules here, that'll push you farther away from crossing the line on God's rules. But God doesn't need your help. All right? You let God's word be enough. And so Adam might have thought, I don't know, I wasn't there, I haven't had a chance to ask him. But he might have thought, well, you know, just don't even touch it. <laughs> All right? And so she went ahead and violated her husband's law, which was bad enough. But that put her in a bad place to now violate God's law. In any event, she took of the fruit of that tree and she did eat it as you know but listen satan was there watching for that opportunity I mean, he watches you he knows what you're looking at he knows what you're reading he, he can't read your mind but he can kind of get a pretty good idea of what you're thinking by the way you're behaving satan's smart he's very 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 smart now i don't know if this to be true if eve was standing there looking at that tree going i wonder why i can't eat that looks good it's a pretty tree. Fruit looks okay. I wonder why I can't eat that. I don't know. What I do know is that's where she was. That I know. That that's where she was. She was there at that tree. That was a bad place to be. And she was looking at that tree and contemplating it, what her thoughts were. Again, we'll have to wait and talk to her when we get to heaven. She's probably going to hide from us. <laughs> We won't have much to say to her. We've done our own messes. So, you know. But anyway, so there she is looking at this tree. Satan sees this, right? He slithers up, hidden. He's in the background. She doesn't know he's there yet. But at the right opportunity, the right moment, he steps forward with a suggestion. And his first suggestion is, yea, hath God said. First thing he wants to do is compromise the word of God. Why? Because that's, the protector, see? That's like the fence that separates you from the, from the cliff. <laughs> That's the railing, as it were, you know? And so Satan wants to come along and to get you to be comfortable to step across the line. That's what he wants to do. So he compromises the authority of the Word of God in your life. Hath God said? And there may be a thousand different ways. He, he might never be able to cause any of you in this room to say, oh, the King James Bible is not the Word of God. Who knows where the Word of God is? It might be in any number of versions. I guess you've got to figure out all of them. And, I mean, he can compromise your, the integrity of the authority of God's Word that way in the minds of many, but probably not very many of you in this room would have that problem. He couldn't get to you that way more than likely. Now, maybe he could, but more than likely he would not be able to do that. But he'll compromise the integrity and authority of God's word in a lot of other ways. In one way or the other, he'll get you to think, well, I know God says this, but. I know the Bible says this, but. Or I know I shouldn't do this, but. 
And there'll be some kind of butt in there that Satan will use to get you to just you be willing to cross the line, cross the barrier, and to get yourself in trouble. He is more subtle than any beast. And let me tell you again, you cannot deal with this guy. He will beat you every single time. Unless you do what I'm going to teach you to do here at the end of this lesson. You will never win. You can't beat him. And even if you do develop the, the ability, the willpower, there are some people who have very, very strong willpower. And even if you are one of those persons who have extraordinary willpower and you're very religiously oriented and, and you can, then all of a sudden you're trapped in another snare. What, what's it called? Self-righteousness. <laughs> you're going just as, and if you're not saved, you're on your way to hell just as fast as the other guy. And maybe even worse off in some ways because you're hardened against the gospel. Now you're okay, I'm okay, I'm fine. And you reinforce that you're okay, I'm fine over and over and over again by how good you are at not doing. And Satan's tricked you. You think you, think you won. Oh, I can't, the devil can't get me to do that. He's got you doing something else. He's happy with you. You're good. You're mine. Self-righteous. Then you become condemning of others and hard-hearted and all kinds of other problems come from that. So I'm... What I'm trying to say is he's very subtle. He's very, very subtle. He knows how to get to you. He knows how to dial. He knows your combination. He knows how to get to you. He understands what you want, what you don't want, what brings up your pride. He knows how to pull your, you know, push your buttons and, and all that kind of stuff. He watches from a hidden place. He slithers about the background of your life, hiding under whatever rocks around you and behind trees and under bushes and, or brush. And, and he'll spring up at just the moment that you have a temptation in front of you. And this is what happens. The Bible teaches this in James. We come back to it later in the lesson. We are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lusts and then enticed. Why has Satan constructed this world? He, the Bible says he's God of the world. Of course, we know he's a false God, right? We know that, little g. But he is God of the world, and he's constantly working through the children of disobedience to set traps for you, constantly, constantly. I'm going to go ahead and give you a little testimony. I think I mentioned it before, but the uh, Lord has uh, brought, this, brought this up in my own life here recently. Um, I enjoy this thing called Pinterest. How many of you use Pinterest? Uh, maybe you shouldn't raise your hand. But anyway, I, I was enjoying Pinterest. I liked it. Uh, I like to play with art a little bit. I like to paint um, when I get the chance. And so I like to collect pictures that I want to paint someday. I've got about five million. <laughs> that I, want. I got a lot of them. And so I'll scroll through there and I'll find, oh, I like that. And I'll put that in this or that category, trees or, or valleys or I'll leave landscapes. And so, you know, I'm... I'm interested in that, right? I was having a problem. Because I'd be going through there and there's some girl dressed inappropriately. Pop. All of a sudden, pop. What's this about? I'll tell that show. Look at this. What's that doing? I get rid of it. I very rarely look at, I, by the way, that's another thing you should know. I, I never look at it, pictures, until my, unless my wife's sitting right there. I just never do. I don't have time any other time. <laughs> and when we're sitting down watching TV and and picking pictures to paint, usually for her. So, but I kept having that problem. Well, let me tell you something. I noticed something. Even though I was getting rid of them, you take a little lick. Well, listen to me. I hope I'm not being too, I'm not exposing you to anything that will bother you, uh, make you uncomfortable. I deal with the devil too. I'm as human as anybody. And I see some women, they're not like nude, they're not nude type thing, but they're just in, a, they're in bathing suits and basically naked as far as I'm concerned. If a woman is showing her thighs, her breasts, or whatever in public, she's naked as far as I'm concerned. That's what the Bible defines nakedness. So I, I'm looking at this stuff. I don't like to see it. It bothers me. And I, oh, get but I noticed I began liking some of these licks. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I'm okay here. Because, well, you can't be a pastor if you're, if you're human. I don't know. I make sure we're okay here. But I, I began, I, I'm teaching you something. If you're listening, you're going to learn something very helpful to you. 
take a little lick. And then began, and I said, ah, uh-uh. no, 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 no. I'm done with this. Because it was getting worse. Even though I'm getting rid of these stupid pictures, then more of them are showing up. So I said, nah, there's something, there's the devil's in this stupid thing. And I got rid of Pinterest because it's full of the devil. I mean, I'm just kidding around a little bit, but I did. I get, took it off my phone. I don't even use it anymore. It's gone. Would you please do that? Would you please do that in the areas of your life where you're having battles? Would you please pay attention when you can see clearly in front of your eyes Satan is building a snare for you and you see it? You're watching it under construction? Would you please do something. Don't just keep going down that path. Stop it. Amen? Now, the devil works in all kinds of subtle ways. He's very, very subtle. He'll catch you when you're standing by the tree. Yeah. He didn't talk to Eve until she was standing by the tree. Right? Then... He shows up. That's when he shows up. So you, that's why I talked about that the other day. You don't want to turn toward it, temptation and then step into it. Once you step into it, the devil's going to come in there, take advantage of that weak moment in your life and drag you down. So you need to fight that thing, amen? You need to fight it all the time. Uh, I mean, and Satan has constructed the world around you, it's unbelievable, you know, how much junk is going on all around you every single day of your life. I'm pretty much immune to it. I don't pay attention to it. I don't even notice it off more, than, more, more often than not. But every now and then I realize, good night. What our young people must go through these days. Man, you can't get away from it. And not just, uh, not just that kind of temptation, but anger. Oh, my soul. It's just everything's angry. <laughs> All the music is angry. Now you compare some of the music today to music you listened to back in the 50s and 60s. Even Well, 60s got a little crazy, I guess. But, but even that, you know, you listen to some of the early rock and roll in the 50s and, and then the early 60s, and you have that transition to 60s where you get into Led Zeppelin and, and some of the other maniacs. Jimi Hendrix and that crowd, where it gets really bizarre. But even that doesn't have the anger that you see today. It, it's there, but not like it is now. It's just downright, you know, kill everybody and rape everybody. And, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable. And, it, it, and the kids are getting pumped with this stuff. And there is a seduction there. And you need to be aware of it. And you need to stay away from it. You see, you've got to get away from the tree. All right, amen? You can't stand there at the tree and think you're going to win because you're not going to win. The devil's going to win because he's just waiting for an opportunity. He wants to lead you into conflict with God so he could compromise God's protection over your life. I was talking about the Bruno about this truth. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, then he will not hear me. Satan's strategy is to get you to start regarding iniquity. Now, it's different, you know, when you're, you're struggling with a temptation, that's not regarding iniquity. When you're regarding iniquity, I like to put it this way because it's somewhat helpful, even though it's not exactly, you know, uh, connected to the word regard. It's still, it kind of works and it'll stick in your mind. It's when you're guarding it. You're guarding it. You're protecting it. When you're regarding it in the sense that you're protecting it, and you could do that in a lot of ways, excuse it. You protect it by offering all kinds of excuses for it. And other ways that you regard, that you, you protect that iniquity in your heart and you keep it away from God, kind of back here. And you maybe put on a facade out here. But, you, but secretly you're regarding iniquity. Yeah. Well, what that does, and Satan knows it, that causes God's ear to turn from you. Now he can move in. He can move in. And so a situation like that it could be where, 
here you are struggling with temptation and you're saying, help me, help me, I don't want to do this. Problem is you're regarding iniquity. You need to disregard that iniquity, as it were. You need to give up the defense of it. You need to confess it. That's what confession means, essentially. It doesn't mean you have to, all of a sudden, be able to no longer have that temptation and be able to never have that appetite or desire again. It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that you humbly confess to God, help me, Father. I know this iniquity is in me. I know this sin. I identify it. I confess it before you. This is my sin. God, help me. And then you'll get help. That's when you get help. Amen? That's when the power of that sin to hold you will be broken and you will be delivered. All right, let's talk about the next thing, the devil. All right? He's the great dragon. That speaks to how powerful he is. Sly deceiver. He's that old serpent. Been at it for a long time. And he is the the subtle, um, what was the word I used? I forgot. Seducer. How do you forget that one? That's exactly what it's all about. He's a subtle seducer. Now, he's the devil. He's the seditious subverter. The seditious subverter. He's our enemy. As I mentioned before, this idea of devil means he's malignant. He's our adversary. He's our tempter. Now, the word subvert means to corrupt. Acts 15, 24 says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. It's an interesting word. In this case, they were subverting their hearers by bringing them under or bringing them down under from the truth into error. Subverting. Kind of like submarining them, if you will, or submerging them or bringing them down from where they ought to be, putting them under the influence of a corrupting influence, bringing them under the power, I should have said, of a corrupting influence. And so it subverts. When we're subverted, we are then um, liable to become perverted. Now, we think of the word pervert in one vein. It's an accurate use of the word in that vein, but that's not the only application of the word. You can be perverted in your doctrine. You can be perverted in your understanding of marriage. You can be perverse. That is, you, don't, you, you can have a, a, a woman that, that believes that she should submit to her husband every time he does what she says. That's perverse. That's subversion. Some of you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> there are some women who actually really do believe the Bible says, submit your wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, and they think they should. Anytime that husband does what she says. As long as that husband's doing what she says to do, then I should submit. <laughs> so, but you can see how perverse that is. It's a perversion of the word of God. And vice or reversa. You know, I should love her only when she submits. Well, of course, I wish. Well, of course I'm supposed to love my wife. And if she submitted, I would. It doesn't work that way. We each have our own personal responsibilities in this regard to God. And my point there is you see how subversion or perversion works not only in one limited narrow view. It certainly applies in that narrow view, but it applies more broadly. I think some of us might need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, I've got some perversity. I've noticed some perversity in my spirit in this or that area. Because Satan has succeeded perhaps to seduce you into a subversion or to subvert you. And then the sedition means to create division. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. This word sedition means to put a division. Uh, that would be, you know, dividing friends or dividing couples or dividing the churches or dividing the community or just divisions, the divisive spirit. Now, you're not being divisive if somebody else is angry at you because you've taken a stand for truth. The one who's being divisive is the one who is resisting truth, not the one who's insisting upon it. So don't fall into that trap. But the devil likes to play both sides of every game. He loves to do that, and he's smart enough to do it too and to do it well. So be careful that you don't, you know, stray from truth to the right or to the left. 
You don't want to stray on either side of truth. It's very important. Move not to the right hand nor to the left uh, and so on. Turn off the right hand nor to the left. Remove that foot from evil. So putting a division between you and God, that's the devil's plan. He wants to put a division between you and God. He wants to drive a wedge between you and God. He wants to create a sedition turning you against God. The crime of sedition in government is to turn citizens against their government. The crime of sedition in God's kingdom is when Satan effectively turns the hearts of God's people against God. And he'll try to do that. He'll do it in all the same ways that it's done, fomenting dis, dis, uh, dissension, excuse me, in, the, in our society. You know, these organizers who uh, organize against this and that and the other, and it's all, it, it's gotten to the place in our country these days, if you're uh, against, uh, oh, whatever, you're a racist. <laughs> you know, just a knee jerk, you're a racist. No matter what, you're a racist. If you're against Colin Kaepernick kneeling when he should be standing for the in honor of the flag for for which so much blood was shed. Oh, you're a racist. That racist has nothing to do with it. You know, it's just crazy how this how this has happened. And and so that's what we're dealing with right now. But that's see, that's sedition. That's fomenting division. That's using division to advance an agenda. That's Satan's way. And so we need to be careful about that. All right. Satan is a tempter. He tempts us. He's called the tempter in Matthew 4, verse 3. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, it says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Paul was concerned that the labor he invested in the Thessalonians would be undone and unraveled because the tempter would come behind him and seduce them away from the truth and seduce them into into a lifestyle that would deny the truth. So it can't happen. You know, the Thessalonian church was reputed to be one of the greatest churches Paul ever started. You know, they ever read the first chapter. He speaks highly of the, of the Thessalonian church. Very highly. Well, that made, I'm not blaming Paul here, but I'm just saying that when a church does well, that makes it a target for the devil. And the devil gave its attention to Thessalonians and began working in there, trying to deceive them with false letters written by Paul, trying to foment all kinds of problems. That's what happens. Satan's real. He's actually on the job. He never rests. He doesn't need to take a, a power nap. He's just on the job constantly. I don't want to discourage you, not leave myself enough time to bring you the encouragement, but you need to know the truth. Satan's a great dragon. Smarter than you, power, more powerful than you. He's a devil, man. He's a malignant enemy. He hates you and wants to destroy your life. Satan is also a very powerful. He's a serpent. He's a dragon. He's a serpent. And he's a powerful devil. And he wants to destroy your life. All right, let's go to the next point. My mind's getting crowded with what I want to get to here in a minute. So let me hurry over to the next point. Satan. A slanderer. He is the slanderer. He is the accuser. Constantly accuses you. One of his favorite things to do is to seduce you into doing something that violates your conscience and then beat you with it over and over and over and over until he beats you down and you feel like I'm no good. There's no hope for me. I can't do this. I can't live this life. Forget it. That's what he wants to do. You need to become aware of his, of, his, of his trick here and understand how to overcome this. If Satan can get you with a compromised conscience to start condemning yourself in your heart, even justly, you start doing his work for him. He's the accuser and you start joining him in the accusation. All right? That's what happens. And when you're doing that, you're just getting more and more defeated. You're becoming more and more weak. And Satan knows it. And he's laughing. He's, he's, just, he's having his time here. <clears throat> All of a sudden, you've got to realize something. You overcome him by the blood that was shed upon the cross. Verse 11. There's a, there's a verse 11 after 9. 9-11. Oh, anyway. 
It's coming up. But there is a verse 11 after verse 9. And verse 11 says that we overcame him. We overcome him by the blood of a lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by loving not our lives unto the death. You can overcome him. Yes, he is incredibly powerful, smarter than you and so on. And in the strength of your flesh, you'll never overcome him. And yes, that serpent is subtle and tricky and watching and coming after you every opportunity he gets. Yes, that devil is malignant and evil. It wants to jump all over you and destroy your life. And yes, Satan is the accuser. He'll draw you in and then beat you up with what you did. What? No wonder God's going to burn that guy forever. That's exactly where he's going to end up. He's going to end up in the lake of fire, burning in fire and brimstone for eternity. And that's exactly where he belongs. I'm looking forward to the day I watch him fall in, get cast in. That's going to be a great day. I'm not going to have a moment's mercy or pity on that stinker. Amen? The day he goes down, it's like, yeah! Whew, glad that jerks out of our life amen but let me tell you something right now you can you can overcome him right now you can overcome him by your faith you need to believe that the blood that was shed on calvary really did break hit the power of sin off of you you need to believe that you need to believe that even at the moment you have made your most miserable failure even when you've walked toward temptation, knocked on the door of temptation, walked into temptation, and reveled in the muck and the filth. Even if you're like one of those Christians that, like a pig, runs back and jumps in the muck. Even if you're like one of those Christians that act like a dog and turns around and eats your own vomit. Even if you have been licking vomit and swimming in muck, you can stop right now. And claim the blood of Jesus Christ. And it'll all be washed away. That's amazing power. Satan cannot hold you down in sin because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. The problem is sometimes, you know, we think of our, we compare ourselves by ourselves. You compare yourself to me or you compare yourself to somebody else you know in the church that's perhaps been in the in the faith for years and years and years and i mean you know you you compare yourself with one another you're making a big mistake you need to compare jesus to the devil that's what you there's the comparison the power of jesus blood to wash away sins and satan's power to get you in it and his blood is greater than satan's power we overcome him by the blood there are too many Christians who have been defeated because of their failures who just sit down and give up and just sit in it. Just, I give up. Well, let me give you a newsflash. It was never about how good you can be in the first place. Are you hearing me? It was never about how good you could be in the first place. It was never about how righteous you could be. It was about the fact that he died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood to wash sins away. And you can get up out of the muck and turn to him and confess, I'm all dirty again. He will wash you. He will put you all clean. And he'll get you going forward again. You turn around, you get back in the muck. He'll get you. Who is the one that said to Peter when Peter asked, how many times do I forgive these knuckleheads? Until seven times? And Jesus said, no, until seven, 70 times. I forget the number. Thank you, 490 times. Now, some of you, I know, the devil's going to tell somebody here right now, well, I know that I couldn't keep track like that, but Jesus can, and I'll bet I've crossed 490. My point is Satan will do whatever he can to put whatever lie he needs to put in your mind to get you down and hold you down and count you out. But Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sins. He provided the blood. The blood washes our sins. 
and we can get up from wherever you are and get back into the fight. The question is, will you get back in the fight? Will you get up and get out of the muck? Okay, I, you slept into it. Okay, I, yeah, you stink. Man, but will you get a bath? See, that's the question. The righteous man falls how many times? And how many times does he get up? Every time. What does that number seven mean? It's completion, isn't it? In other words, even the righteous man blows it. Entire. There's nobody so righteous that he has come to some kind of a, well, there are a few. Like, there's a Job. There are the Daniels, right? There's the Job, the Daniels, the Noahs. I haven't met one. When I look in the mirror, I don't see one. I know they're out there. People that can save themselves by their own righteousness. I mean from temporal judgments, not from eternal judgment. But guys that are really, really, you know. But I, I'll guarantee you one thing. You know how every one of them got there if they're there? If they did get there. You know, anybody who is at that place, let me tell you how they got there. They got there by overcoming him by the blood of a lamb. Job was making sacrifices every single morning. Come on. Noah made his sacrifice and so on. By the blood of a lamb, by the word of their testimony, Job said, I'm a sinner. Didn't he? Job said, if I say that I'm not a sinner, I'm perverse. By the word of his testimony and by loving not their life unto death. Job said, though he slay me, that will I serve him. So even those men, at the, the height that they reached, they got there the same way anybody else can get there, and that's this way. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's by the word of our testimony, which is to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead. And it is by this. You know, I, you get into the muck every now and then, but then you come around and you go, man, I hate that. Good. That's good. Then get a bath. Put on the perfume of the fragrance of prayers, the incense of prayer. Get back in the Word of God and get washed up in the water of His Word. And then understand this. I've been touching on this several times the last couple of messages here and there. Let me conclude with it how important this is. You need to learn to follow what Jesus said by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is the way we walk in the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You've got to do that. You've got to do it. Obviously, you confess your sin. If, there's, if you're regarding iniquity in your heart, I explain that. That's different. That's a different category of situation here. My, that's not somebody who goes through life and from time to time slips into sin or gets tempted and strays and then, you know, gets convicted and turns back. And I'm, That's somebody who is actively protecting an area of sin in their life. God, you stay out of it. Leave me alone. I'm going to keep this. That's a whole different category of Christian. That person's headed toward death. There is a sin that God will kill you for. And John said, I say not that you pray for it. That kind of person has, has set themselves as God's enemy. And they're likely to go out like Ananias and Sapphira or like some of those others. That's a very different category. But if you slip into sin, you're convicted about it, you confess the sin. You confess it. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Giving thanks. A singing and making melody in your heart. Giving thanks always. Speak. Sing. Well, you could say submit there because giving thanks is submitting to God. And then tell somebody. If, you, if you're consistently being defeated, you need to get connected with somebody who can help you be accountable. Accountably submitting yourselves one to another. So because alliteration helps us remember, just remember this way. 
speak a word, sing a song, submit through thanksgiving. And then you need to be submitted to somebody, to one another, in the fear of God. You need accountability. All right? You need accountability. You need to seek out someone that you can be accountable to who will help you, help you grow. Amen? So we always tell those who are newly saved, here's my number, give me a call. If you have any questions, if something comes up, you have some struggles, whatever, give us a call. That's what we're trying to to tell you. Uh, Satan is going to come after you. Is there anybody here who can give testimony and say, I got saved and I never got tempted again? I mean, come on. Is there anybody who could say, I got saved? You know, I never did any of the things I ever did before. I never did them again. I don't know. It's just, we, we battle this thing of sin all the time because the devil uses it to defeat you and bring you down and keep you under. That's how he does it. Well, you just rise up in Jesus' name. Amen. And claim the victory he paid so dearly for you to have. I mean, he paid dearly for you to have this victory. So use it. Let's stand together, please. Father, I, I know Satan loves to draw us into darkness. And they get us in there where we can't see our way out. But then you turn on the light of your word and you shine it and you say, and you show, oh, there's the door. And it's the same door as always. That's the door. You're the door. You're always the way out. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, if there's anybody who's been seduced by Satan in any of these ways to kind of get into that dark place in their lives, that they'll see the light shine bright and they'll come toward that light and come out of that dark place and get right with you. And be a testimony and a witness to all around of the power of God's grace and mercy and goodness and love. And I praise you for this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.